Good morning. This is Sarah Seamount, Migrant Coordinator for Idaho, and our recording today is about determining who gets priority for services and the process that makes this really easy for you to accomplish to make sure that students are getting the services that they need. So in our welcome and introductions, if you would like to please put in the chat, I think many of you already have your name and district. And if you'd like to, you could add what made you decide to attend this training. And thank you very much for being here. So why do we identify priority for services? Uh, the students that we prioritize in law have to be those students who have made a qualifying move within the previous one year period and who are failing or most at risk of failing to meet our state's challenging academic standards, and we know they are challenging, or have dropped out of school. So essentially there are two criteria. The student has to have a qualifying move within the last one year, and they have to be at risk of failing or have previously dropped out of school, which I think we would all agree is also a great risk factor. And this is straight from the law. So in the law, it said that we shall give priority. And so how do we define this phrase in Idaho? And the way that we have defined it is, if there are not enough resources for all migrant students to receive a service, these students are prioritized and get served first. One example of this would be, if you have a limited number of spaces for your summer school program, and you have more than that number of students that want to participate, your priority for services students get those spaces ahead of other students. They are served first. In addition, if we have a student uh, who is priority for services, they can be served sometimes with greater intensity than other migratory students. And this, another example of this is the frequency with which a graduation specialist might choose to meet with students, maybe instead of once a month, maybe it's once a week, depending on the student's priority for services status. So how do we determine who is PFS? And I'm gonna show you the easy way. There's probably a hard way, but we don't wanna know about that. So timing matters. You should start early in the fall and determine for every returning student, migrant student, if they qualify for PFS. PFS status must be determined every year. It, it is important to start as early as possible, ideally in September, but not later than October for returning students. And the reason for this is that students will only appear on the list if they have a qualifying arrival date in the last year. So if a student moved in the previous October and you didn't do your, run your list until December, that student would not show as having had a QAD in the last year and therefore would not be on the list and would not have any opportunity to be considered for priority for services. Step one, priority for services worksheet. This is in MSIS. When you get into MSIS on the navigation toolbar, which is the, on the left side of the page, you will see your district name and below that your district migrant summary and district reports. You wanna click on district reports. On the right-hand side, you'll then see a list of all the reports that are available. The second section is district worksheets. You want to go to the second of those that says priority for services worksheet and click on that. This will run an Excel spreadsheet, which will open on your computer, which means you do have to have Excel available on your computer. You will save this Excel worksheet to use for the entire year. So you will only run this report once a year in order to add, in order to create a worksheet that you will use all year long. You may actually run it later to see if some students have um, scores showing, but the, you'll continue to use the worksheet that you ran first thing in the fall. And you'll add students to it as they arrive throughout the year. So here is the worksheet and what it looks like. You can tell I, I ran this one for Mountain Home School District. 
What you will see in the criteria one QAD in the last year column is that every single student has a Y for yes. We don't show students that don't meet this first qualification because the computer is perfectly capable of giving us the information that we need to know if students meet the first criteria. The second criteria has to do with the student's risk factors, and that requires some human review of each student. So if you look here, all of these students, and this is not the full list, all of these students have met that first criteria. Step two, if you look at columns H through L, now is the time to look for any students who do not have state assessments. So you're filling in gaps now before you're making the final determinations. And here are my suggestions. You can look in M6 for other state assessments. So the student may have an assessment in M6 for Oregon or Texas or Florida, and it should say proficient or not proficient. That's all we need. We don't need to be able to interpret those test scores further than that. You, will, you can also look for district assessments that you can use. These have to be skills assessments, not unit tests for a particular curriculum. At the end of this presentation, we will look briefly at the guidance because there is an actual list of examples for state or district assessments that you may be able to use. Um, and some of those may be somewhat outdated, but essentially you're looking for an assessment that shows if the student is at grade level for reading or math, science or social studies, any of those are acceptable. Make note of these in the appropriate column. So in other words, if you look at column K, it equals reading or English language arts, column L equals math. And I'm sorry, I, I guess I misspoke. The only things that we're looking for are reading slash English language arts or math. We're not looking at science and social studies. Uh, I don't know if those can be used. I, I would like to say yes, but let's stick with the ones that we know we can use. The next column you're gonna look at is column M and you're going to review each of the students and you will put in yes for any student who has previously dropped out. This is something that was changed in the new law when the Every Student Succeeds Act came into being. We now are asked to check and see if our students have dropped out. If they have dropped out and meet the other criteria of having a QAD in the last year, uh, we can mark those as yes. Step three. Determining the academic risk. So now you're to the point of making some decisions. And if you look at column N, if the student is less than proficient on any grade level or not at grade level for any of the columns H through L, mark yes on column M. What that means is the student is not proficient on a state assessment, any state assessment, and so therefore is considered to be at risk of failing. And then you will also look to see if the student dropped out of school. And if that is marked yes, you will also mark that the student has an academic risk in column N. Mark all others as no, if there is no academic risk or mark NA if the student is not in school. So for preschoolers who are not attending school, or students who are here to work and not, they are out of school youth, but not drop out, uh, then those students can also be marked as NA. So you're finally to the point where you are going to determine if the student is eligible for priority for services. This information will go into column O. So if column N, the academic risk is yes, you will also put yes in column O. And the reason for that is we've already determined that any student on the list has the first criteria, which is a QAD in the last year. When you get to adding new students later in the year, you'll add every new student you identify. And so you will have some where they, actually all of those students should have a QAD in the last year because they're just newly identified as migrant. So for those students, you would also look 
to see if they have the academic risk. After you've done that and made your determination, you look up the student in MSIS. Once there, you go to the current year data and check the box priority for services, as you see done here. Now we're gonna talk a little more about what you do as new students enroll in your district. So if you have a new student that you've just identified as a migratory student, add their name and test information to the bottom of the spreadsheet. You also know that that student, if newly identified, probably has a qualifying arrival date in the last year. There may be a case or two where that's not true in the form of continuing enrollment, but in most cases, the student will have a QAD in the last year and you can put yes for criteria one and that's in column G. Look up the state assessment scores in M6 or M6 and add that information to columns H through L. And then complete column M, which remember is the one that asks if the student has previously dropped out. Determine if the student qualifies and mark them in M6, M6 if appropriate. So essentially you're adding to your list as you identify new students throughout the year. <clears throat> so here, and this PowerPoint will be added to the website, here is where you will find the guidance that we'll go look at here in just a moment. And once you find that, you'll be able to find some additional information on district tests that you may be able to use for determining academic risk. And there are two different websites showing here. One is our State Department of Education website, and the other one is an actual link to the document. So we'll go there. So this shows the academic risk, and this is slightly outdated. Um, and we have made corrections to it, but it doesn't look like it's been updated on the website to reflect the changing uh, changed access uh, requirements. So we will definitely make sure that that gets done, but there are our criteria. If the student has no state assessment scores, then we say district scores, RTI screeners, or progress monitoring assessments can be used. Lack of credits may be used or other state assessments may be used if showing less than proficient. And then criteria two is has dropped out of school. So you always use criteria one first as a first choice. If it is not available, then you can use criteria one B. Criteria also always works. And then this shows the interruption. So here is a list of examples of some objective measures of student ability for reading and math. There may be others, and this list has existed since at least 2018. So there may be others that are more current that are not, that are not listed here. If you know of some additional uh, ex examples of objective measures to verify that the student is struggling academically and is at risk, please feel free to send those to me. I would love to have those. You'll also see at the end of the document that there are some frequently asked questions. One of the questions asks who should do it. And I would say this is always best done as a group effort. If you and your liaison and director work together, um, it always kind of makes the work lighter when two people share it, but it is something that's relatively straightforward and the liaison can do it on his or her own. Um, when should we make the determination? Remember, always make the determination annually for returning students as soon in the fall as you possibly can. And then how long are they eligible? They're eligible for one year. And then a little more information about what to do with that information. So please feel free to look at that. All right. So we are going to complete a couple of samples together before we finish the recording. And then we can also talk, I have a longer list that we can look at. So in this example, we have just a few students, I believe there are six, and the very first student has lots of holes. So 
I went, whoops, excuse me. I guess I can't type in there. So we'll have to pull up the Excel spreadsheet. I actually went and looked up this first student and discovered that it was a preschooler not enrolled in school. So the student has a move in the last year, but does not have any assessments, cannot have dropped out of school because he or she has not entered school. And so therefore we do not currently have a risk factor for that student. So this student would not be priority for services. When I look at the next student, a 10th grader, this student is not proficient in their language assessment and therefore having a move in the last year and being less than proficient on a state assessment, this student would be marked as at risk academically and therefore PFS. The next student you'll see is a third grader who is proficient on the IRI, but is still not proficient on the access. And so therefore is not is still more academically at risk than a student who is not, uh, who is more at risk than students who are proficient on the access test. So this student, you would say yes and yes. The next student has two different assessments. An eighth grader has an ISAT for reading, and it's a level two that is less than proficient, but a level three is proficient. So what do you do in the case where you have two assessments, uh, one showing that the student is proficient and one showing that the student is not? If the student is not proficient on one assessment, that still shows that that student is more highly at risk than if they were proficient on all of their assessments. So this student would also qualify as being academically at risk and would be a yes here and PFS. This student, the seventh grader, is clearly PFS. He or she is not proficient on the access test. He or she is also not proficient on ISAT or math. And then finally, the last student, uh, we have that the student is, yes, got to move in the last year, a QAD in the last year, but this student is proficient on their ISAT English language arts and ISAT math. So the answer is no, this student is not academically at risk and therefore is not priority for services. And here's information for contacts here at the department. And I'll always include this slide so you'll have our contact information. And with that, I will finish the recording and then we can have some questions. <laughs>